normal movie anymore. I don't know about you. No. Uh, it, it's it, maybe it's not harm, but it's not quite not harm. If that makes sense. His his ordinary way of life is no longer possible for him. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's pretty rough for me, you know. So he's, I think that's the meaning of that. You know, you better not go to any other city. If you did this in other cities, you know, they would, they would put you in jail as a sorcerer. Well, and, and well, uh, Athens isn't going to treat him very well either. But. And in the seventh letter, Plato writes about that very thing happening to him. He's detained and I don't know if he's exactly jailed, but in, you know, he's, he does not have his liberties because of his teaching. It happens. Yeah, I I hadn't made that connection. Yeah, the um, there is what there's a big question that's behind all of this. Is the philosophic way of life congenial to life in the city? That's a good question. Uh, it will ruin a cocktail dinner or party. I promise you. Oh my gosh. And that's really the worst thing about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> like you ever been at, you go to one of these things and, and people come up to you and they say, well, what do you do for a living? And you tell them, well, I, I run seminars and I, I read great books and that, and I, I do strength training and that, and both of those are subjects nobody wants to talk about. You know, they want to talk about, um, football or something and which i'm not against it but i'm not very interested in it and if i talk about the things that i want to it's like uh it's like that scene from caddyshack when the baby ruth gets thrown into the pool yep nobody wants to touch this stuff because it's 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 it makes you not normal yeah does it make you better I, I certainly believe so. You know, the, the, the unexamined life, you know, and, and is, is not worth living. They, you know, we were told, and I, I, I believe that's true. Um, sometimes I envy the simple person, you know, um, who, who goes about life and sees things on their face uh, as uh, on face value and takes them as they are and um, doesn't, deconstruct or and um you know lives lightly you know if you will i don't know i'm trying to be trying to be polite here um sometimes i wish i could do that um, but you know this is this is a discussion for uh the republic isn't it mm -hmm. you know once you once you come out of the cave you know can you come back will the people that are in the cave will they talk to you will they treat you graciously um the answer to those things are no um but does that mean you shouldn't do it? Yeah. So should, well, Mino, you thought he knew what he was talking about and now he doesn't. Um, is it of benefit to him to actually know what virtue is? Will he make better speeches if he knows what virtue is? <laughs> well, if well, it he... really depends on the type of speeches, right? That's a, that's a big part of the drama of this dialogue is, Mino is used to the aristic, argumentative form of speech. If he discovers virtue, perhaps that form of speech will have to change the dialectical form, which is not nearly as appealing. And yeah, I don't want to jump to the Republic too much because that's ancillary to this, but this is something that does come up, that you have two paths. Um, you can either make the argument of, argumentative speeches and judge between them, or you could search for the truth together. Uh, that latter one might not be so fun amongst crowds. But there could be a benefit to it. Yeah, I, and this would be a good question for Republic. You know, what are the conditions that need to be true for it to be a benefit? You know, what what good is it for you and I to to, for the three of us to chat about virtue? Um, 
it's diverting, you know, but unless we live in a, I, I don't know, unless you live in a particular kind of polis, uh, will it bear any fruit? Um, I don't know. I, I, I still think Mino ought to look. <laughs> well, uh, I think. D- d- does, does an inquiry have to bear fruit, like in terms of the polis and not the individual though? And, and if it's good for the individual, is it not ultimately then good for the polis? Maybe depends on the relationship between the city and the individual. Between you know, the that, in, that's, um, between the individual and know, the I'm, proper I'm, polis. Yeah, in a proper polis that they sh- perhaps shouldn't be opposed, but in most cities, most polis, they they probably are. Um, and, and that's that's really interesting because. <laughs> You know, th- this is an inquiry into virtue, and uh, after the after the proof, um, Socrates asks. I think he's I think he's talking to Antitus at that point. Um, you know, d- doesn't virtue improve people? You know, or d- aren't, don't people who have virtue or aren't people who have virtue good? You know, is virtue good? Yes. You know, so good things have a nature. Blah blah blah. So could you ever? do wrong by inquiring into the good. Mm -hmm. And Socrates thinks no. Aristotle thinks no. I think no. The good is good in in all respects. And um, you're you're right. You know, the polis often will not tolerate um, an honest discussion of what the good is. Uh, or, Or in this case, you know, how to obtain the good, which I think is virtue. Virtue, virtuous acts are how you obtain the good. But it does seem to tolerate discussions from sophists, which poses the challenge to whether or not you can actually bring people to virtue. Because that's, I I don't want to jump past the geometry because I know Carl's really excited about it. Uh, But that is, that's the back, that's the last movement of this dialogue is you have this group of sophists who go around educating people, claiming to know what virtue is, claiming to be teachers, yet they ruin everything they touch. And the polis <laughs> cannot stop them. And philosophy seems impotent to stop them as well. well and nobody recognizes that they're ruining everything they touch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, let's put that on hold. Let's let's go one page further. Uh so Socrates says, let's try anyway. Mino, but Mino has this paradox. I think we talked about it two weeks ago. This is at 80D. In what way, Socrates, will you seek out that about which you don't know at all what it is? But by setting out for yourself what sort of a thing from among those you don't know, will you make your inquiry? Or even if you happen right upon it, how will you know that this is that thing which you didn't know? It's like, uh, you don't know it at all. How would you even start looking for it? And furthermore, how would you recognize it when you saw it? And that's... Um, Rumsfeld's I, I think paradox. That's the known knowns, the unknown knowns, and the unknown unknowns. Right? Right. It's a real problem. Yeah, you might walk, <laughs> you might walk by it and never, never see it. Yeah, this is a serious question, right? Like, it, it goes to problems of like knowledge creation. How do we create knowledge that we don't even know to look for? How do we recognize it as knowledge or correct knowledge when we stumble upon it? And um, you know, for me, it's like a this is like a, a, a pedagogical ped, pedagogical problem too. You know, uh, uh, you, you gotta you gotta get a, a um, a three-year-old in front of you, you know, how, how do you get this kid to ultimately read? Um, he, he doesn't know what he's doing. I, I'm going to be the, I'm going to be the, the midwife, you know, um, and, and, and lead them through a, both a training and an educational process. Cause there is training involved in reading. Um, cause there's a skill element. Um, and there's also, you know, a, an abstract element that has to be taught, but 
you know, how, how do you lead somebody from no knowledge to knowledge? How do you lead them or how do you lead yourself from no knowledge of the things you have no knowledge of into those, into new knowledge? Um, I mean, th- this is, this is one of the big problems just being a person is really interesting to me. I'm not doing a good job of, of voicing yeah, I think it's a, all of my problems. I, let me, it. I think it's a potency and act thing. You know, how do you go from, how do you get to actually be in a state when you weren't potentially in a state? Yes. And I mean, it, it, it is like about metaphysical states, you know, doing, going from the potential to know to actually knowing, but it's also, if you don't know what it is you're trying to know, how do you know when you know it? Like how, how do you verify mm-hmm. that you now have this new piece of knowledge? You know, if you're Newton and the apple hits you on the head and then he says, Eureka, I'm, I'm mixing my guys. Uh, <laughs> he, <laughs> he jumps in a bathtub That's full of amazing. apples and it overflows. And he says, um, how does he know he got there? I'm in a bathtub full of apples. <laughs> yeah. I always and he find says, that Eureka. Funny. Archimedes was in the bathtub. Right. Yeah. It, it, he's walked, which means I have found it. And he runs around the town naked, uh, you know, yelling to everybody, I have found it. I have found it. And you're just wondering if they're all saying, we didn't know you'd lost it. Right. Uh, no, you... I mean the, the problem of buoyancy and the King's crown. Oh, okay. Archimedes. Sure. Uh, Sure. Uh, So there has to be, it seems to me, well, either we have two alternatives. One is that knowledge is not possible, that it is not possible to come to actually know anything. And I I think this is a real live option. It is an option that um, some people think, you know, Mina says earlier in the dialogue, somehow I think virtue is not like these other cases. In other cases of uh, strength or whatever, where you can find a definition and get knowledge, he thinks virtue is not like those other cases. That you know, every college student in America pretty much thinks that. You know, you can figure out um, in detail all the specs on your cell phone, but you can't know whether or not, um, I don't know, a certain form of marriage is better than another. You can't know anything about ethics. It's a it's undiscovered country. You can't do it. Uh, so maybe that's the possibility. And we should live like skeptics and just realize that we can't know anything. And you know, just be happy. Go touch some alleged grass and forget about all these questions. Have a normal one. Um, yeah, have a normal one. But how do you know it can't be known? It's the same darn. It's the same problem. <laughs> well, has anybody ever known anything? Uh, at the bottom there, uh, well, it's, we, we've got different, we've got addition, different additions here. Um, let's see. I think it's an 81 E something like that. Um, I may be wrong about the number, but, but later on Socrates says, well, no matter what, it's best for us as, as though, as, if we proceed as though we can obtain knowledge. And um, and I yeah, think so I think this is claim. right. Yeah, but it would be it, if it was not possible, it would be pointless. Yeah, he you says, have to overcome me, you know, somehow. Yeah, it's eighty-one d and a half, roughly. He says we must therefore not believe that debater's argument that you know we can't we can't know things that we can't that we don't know. Essentially, he says for it would make us idle and faint-hearted men like to hear it, whereas my argument makes them interjected, energetic and keen on the search. I trust that this is true, and I want to inquire along with you into the nature of virtue. So he says, you know, we're going to pretend, we're going to pretend like we can, uh, we can search for things that we, that, and we don't know what they are. And um, I think that's best. Is, mm-hmm. is, is this the noble lie? I don't know. I don't know if it's a noble lie. This is, and the term there. Or trusting, um, if that's what I think it is, that is uh, pisteo, uh, to trust. Uh, it is the verb that means faith in the New Testament. Uh, and I think, but I don't want to put that baggage on the text. What I mean by that, though, is 
you do have to per- you do have to proceed with some trust when you enter into conversation with anybody. Um, there has to be some trust at the beginning, even if you think that something cannot be known. You're still trusting that that's true, and so it's the stepping stone into something else. I think maybe the the more troubling thing to think about is to what extent have we eroded our ability to trust in anything as a foundation, mm-hmm. right? If if you don't grant even that little bit of trust, how can I move yeah. anywhere? Yeah. I remember a while back, there was a thing in First Things about uh, teaching everybody critical thinking, which was, is that still the, it's probably still the rage in academia, or maybe it's been replaced by something even worse. But you know, you're know, you supposed to get your students all to critically think. And it was the editor of First Things at that time. I forget his name, Reno. And he said, no, what we need to do is get critical judgment. You know, and judgment is a connection of two things. And with the copula is, you know, the book is blue. That's a judgment. That involves stepping out of yourself and putting a stake in the ground. This is true. You have to, and if you don't think it's possible to do, you could never do it. And all you can do is poke holes in everybody else's argument. I, I like pointing out that, that that common root for the word faith, it is going to be kind of a faith, epistemic faith. You have to believe that you can get there. Uh, but why should we? So Socrates tells this story. I love this story. I, on some days, I believe it completely. Uh, you trust it completely. Yes, I, what, sometimes Riley? I recollect it. 81B, the ones saying this are all those among whom the priests and priestesses who've been concerned with being able to give an account of the matters in their purview. But Pindar says this too. Uh, and they say, oh, let me go down. For they assert that the human soul is immortal and that at one time it comes to an end, what is in fact called dying, that at another it comes into being once again, but never perishes. So they assert on account of the, these things one should live one's life as piously as possible. And then he's got a quote from, uh, I don't know who it's a quote from. I'm going to go down a paragraph. Since the soul is immortal and has come to be many times and has seen both the things here and those in Hades, in fact, all things, there isn't anything it hasn't learned. As a result, it's being able to recollect what pertains to virtue and other things is nothing to be wondered at since it also knew them previously. And here is the thing that I really like, which I think is the point. For nature as a whole being akin, and the soul having learned all things, nothing prevents someone, once he's recollect, recollected just one thing, what human beings call learning, to discover all else, if he's courageous and doesn't grow weary in the search. So here's the sketch. Here's the story Socrates is telling you. Uh, there, there's an eternal cycle. Your soul has been through the, the divine plumbing infinity times and uh you've seen everything but you know when you're born it it probably causes you to forget your bodies are uh this mortal coil makes you forget things but you can remember you know it's like uh there's that kid from high school that you haven't thought about in in 35 years and somebody says do you remember andy Andy, who, you know, Andy, that guy that, that, uh, uh, yeah, he played, he played trumpet in the band. Do you remember? Oh yeah, Andy. And then you start remembering all sorts of things about him and remember times that you spent with him. At least this is the case with me. Uh, if Andy is listening, Hey Andy, how are you doing? Uh, but once you remember that little bit, you start to remember everything else. And so learning then becomes remembering, re-remembering, anemnesis, recollection. Ooh, I got to give you uh, 20 seconds of trivia. The Eucharistic prayer in the Greek liturgies is called the anemnesis, the recollection. All right, that's it. I'll pile onto your trivia uh, just very briefly. The Greek word for truth, aletheia, has at its root, Lath, right? the famous river that appears yeah. at the end of the Republic. So aletheia, Greek, and tr- truth means without forgetting. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or the unforgotten or something. Yeah. That's a, it's pretty cool. <sighs> More trivia. Gosh. I've been indexing my, yeah, Scott. my books by the Dewey decimal system. And I, mm. I found, um, a copy of, I think, um, Number uh, edition nine of the Dewey Decimal Classification System, and Melville Dewey at that point was still editing the thing, and he's doing and and he um he he wrote it in a new phonetic spelling system that he and a few others at Harvard had invented to get rid of all the weird English spelling problems where philosophy starts with a ph instead of an f and you know all of these problems with English phonetics and spelling. And he, he wrote the whole darn book in this sort of, it, it reads like pigeon. It, I, I couldn't believe it. I had never heard that he did this. Um, I got the receipts. I can show you. He did it. And I thought, this is really clever. Why hasn't anyone done this? Why, why, why haven't we done this? It's because we lose so much meaning in these words because when we, when we spell them phonetically, uh, we, we lose the Greek root. We lose the Latin root. You can't trace it back. You really can't know what the word means if it's not spelled with what seems like all these idiosyncratic spellings. I know it's hard to master, but the f- but the reason it's hard to master is because there's so much meaning in English words. There's way more than it sounds like. And um, anyway, Melville Dewey wanted to get rid of that. And that would make it harder and harder to, I like that. to make these... You know, was he uh, the connections is, you make? What's his connection with Herman Melville? Is it just a coincidence? Melville Dewey and uh, Herman Melville. I think it's a. I don't know. Yeah, was he named after? I I don't know. They were. Con- I think they were probably contemporary. Mm. Um, I don't know. I couldn't. I couldn't believe that but spelling stuff. I'm gonna Wacky. avoid that. Uh, I'm gonna avoid that rabbit hole. Otherwise, you sit. You'll hear. You guys will hear us just clicking as we're looking. I'm on, already doing on it. the internet. Too late. Can I ask uh, you a question about the passage you read, Carl? Sure. Um, in the interest of of looking ahead, so one of the things that Socrates says at the end of that quotation is, uh, "If he is courageous and doesn't grow weary in the search of the truth, does this mean that when Socrates brings in Mino's slave boy, that the slave boy is being courageous?" And perhaps more courageous than Mino himself. Oh yes, that's that's interesting too, isn't it? Yes. So um, Mino has said that virtue is to be able to rule, and we had this question earlier about if that's the case, then slaves certainly could not have virtue. And so when you have the example of, well, you have a slave there, right? Let me talk to him. Uh, and the slave is going to to show the courageous and manly sort of activity that Socrates is recommending. That's. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a yeah it's a dig at Mino I'm sure I don't know if Mino figured it out but you know th- this kid from your house is able to do this yeah I always when I read this yeah, I right. always um, sympathize with the slave boy you know can you imagine this guy owns you and he's got this snub nosed wackadoo in there and they're arguing about this and you're just trying to keep their wine cup full. And they're like, hey, you're suddenly in the middle of this. Have a seat. Here's a ge- geometry proof. <laughs> oh, I mean, the stress. I mean, it had to have been just anxiety-inducing, nerve-wracking for that poor kid, you know? Yeah, you wonder, whatever happened to him? I wish we had his name. So, uh... And- if he had his name, I wish we Mino had his slave. name. He's called, yeah, Mino Slave. And so he's going to, uh, he finds that he speaks Greek, so he's not a barbarian. Uh, he's born in Mino's household. There's probably something to that. You know, if, if virtue can't be taught or if things can't be taught, well, how did he learn all this stuff? Hmm. We lived in your house. Uh, there's probably something interesting going on there. So the problem is, if you take a square, uh, we don't have to do the problem. I don't have a whiteboard app. How do you double the area of a square? So if you have a square that's area four, 
it's two per side, two units per side. How do you make a square of area eight? Which is not as simple a problem as you think. If you know some geometry, you've already figured out that Socrates is, is playing a fast one here. Uh, it's not a straightforward answer. And the boy says, well, you double the side. Well, if you double the side, you have a four by four square and the area is 16, which is twice as much as you need. He's confused then and he says, well, what about three? I know it's got to be between two and four. And if you make a square that's three on the side, three times three is nine, and that's still too big. So it's somewhere between two and three, but uh, the boy has no idea. He thought he knew, he was confident, and then uh, he finds out that he doesn't know. Yeah, at 84, when Plato stops talking to the slave boy and he turns to Mino and he says, this young man has reached the point where he knows he doesn't know. And th that's the turning point. You know, when you, when you're learning anything, you know, when you realize that you don't know, um, he says, now he does, does think himself at a loss. And as he does not know, neither does he think he knows. And, then Socrates says, so he's now in a better position with regard to the matter he does not know. And Mino, Mino agrees with him. Th this is where you want to be. And this is the problem with Twitter. <laughs> and just the very next line uh, picks up on where Carl started us a little bit earlier. Socrates asks Mino, in making him perplexed and feel numb, as the stingray does, surely we didn't harm him at all. Not in my opinion, at least. And opinions are going to be important later. Yes. Uh, yeah, and... but what if he hung around with a gang of ageometric youth? <laughs> you know, and like he was a leader of the gang, a bunch of slave boys running around doing wrong geometry. And he was a king amongst them. But now that he knows that he doesn't know, he can no longer with good conscience, go and play these games anymore. Socrates. So, I, I, go ahead, John. He, Socrates is making a huge claim right here because he's saying, even though he hasn't increased in knowledge in terms of the investigation, he is improved when he realizes he doesn't know. Yeah, he is... He has decreased his non-knowledge. Is that right? Wait. I mean, uh, he, he has gained in knowledge in, in that he has the knowledge of not knowing. But, in ter but, in, but even in terms of the investigation at hand, Socrates claims that he's better, that he has, in, that he has well, that he's improved. Yeah, I, and I think it, you, you might want to think what does this presume what has to be true for it to be better to know something well knowing has to be good in some way uh later on they talk about advantageous i i suppose if you're laying out your property it's better to know how to double a square than not to know how to double a square uh it help you do things better but that presumes so if i'm going to use the word better this is like a, my, my favorite of the Thomistic proofs is it's either number four or five. It's the, the one that talks about there is there are things which are better than other things. Which not everybody will grasp. But if there are, in fact, things that are better than other things, then there has to be something that is the best. So once we start figuring out that this boy is better off to know that he doesn't know, then the whole horizon of the good and what it means opens up for us. When he knows, it's a big deal. When he realizes that he doesn't know, is he now better than Mino? Well, Mino, we know what happened to Mino. Tortured to death for a year in Persia somewhere after trying to betray all of his companions. 
So I guess yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and there and he makes it this explicit. There's some more digs on Mino. Uh, Mino keeps his composure pretty well. Uh, so go down to just before 84C. We've done him some benefit, as is likely with a view to discovering how the matter stands. For now, he might even gladly inquire because he doesn't know. But then he easily supposed that he could speak that he would speak well before many and many times about the doubled figure to the effect that the line ought to be doubled in length. Which is, you know, a direct quote. Mino said, "I made sp very many speeches before ma very many people, and quite good ones about virtue." Well, the boy could have made speeches about the doubled square. Ignorant and wrong speeches. He was benefited then by being numb. Ah, uh, yeah, I, mean, I think so, but yeah. I actually want to keep reading just to, from where you left off, Carl, because it's a real, a re I can't speak, a revealing statement about what being perplexed or aberia does. So Mino concedes it's likely, uh, and Socrates says at 84C, so do you think that he would have attempted to inquire into or learn that which he supposed he knew but didn't before he fell into perplexity by having come to believe that he didn't know and before he felt a longing to know? Not in my opinion, Socrates. He was benefited then by feeling numb, in my opinion. Examine then what he will in fact discover, starting from this perplexity by inquiring with me, though I'm doing nothing other than asking questions and am not teaching him. And be on guard if you somewhere you discover me teaching him and explaining things for him rather than just asking him about his opinions. Right. Um, that numbness actually calls forth desire or longing in this instance. Uh, and I think this is where perhaps, because we had allusions at the beginning of the dialogue, Mino is a very erotic man. And yet perhaps he is not longing after what he should long after, which is what is true and knowledge. But if he would be just a little more perplexed, his desires and longings could be rightly ordered. Uh, and I think this is just a beautiful illustration that, Right. Socrates is not a strict rationalist. Learning is as much about longing as it is thinking oh. things through and calculating them. But you have to show somebody that they do in fact desire something more than what they have. Yeah. So it's a love story is what you're saying. Yes, uh, and it'll be on Lifetime next year. Philosophy. I mean, it's, it's in the word. Unless Melville Dewey respells it. You know, it's, it's about, yeah. it's about, you know, a, a love of wisdom wanting to become one with this wisdom. And, um, if you don't have the perplexity, you can't do it. And. <sighs> but this is what, and this is what causes a lot of people not to want to do this. I mean, lots of yes. people are not comfortable with, not comfortable with perplexity. Uh, they perhaps they, they don't recollect very well just feel it see they would rather not even ask the question and for i don't know maybe for many of them it's probably okay D did i talk about this when when last we met about the uh the straight a student in the great books i guess not uh do it again um you know we've helped thousands of people at this point do these seminars and read these books and i have found that Excellent students really struggle, particularly when we get to Aristotle, because when you read Aristotle, um, you're just at, you're like you said, you're at sea for days and days and weeks and months. You know, to understand metaphysics, you have to understand categories. To understand categories, you have to understand prior, like it, you have to haul, you have to get all the balls in the air before you can start to catch some of them. And um, it's an uneasy feeling. You're unprovided, John. Um, and, and people who have pushed the pellet, the academic pellet, and got the or button and gotten the academic pellet, you know, uh, study, take the quiz on Friday, get the grade, study, kick the quiz on Friday, get the grade. You know, the, the weeks and months of uncertainty of wrestling with Socrates or having Aristotle just beat you up. Uh, 
is, 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 it's too uncomfortable of a feeling for them to endure. And they often quit. My, my, my oldest daughter would say they had complete ego death because they had identified as somebody that could do these sorts of things. But, but reading these great books, particularly Socrates and Aristotle, aren't actually like what you do in school. It's not, I was going to say it's not tidy. Aristotle is very tidy, but um, he can't be distilled down and simplified to, you know, chapter one, chapter two, chapter three in a ninth grade textbook and get you where you need to be with him. You have to do the work. You have to be uncertain. You have to get lost. You have to reconsider. You have to destroy the thing you thought before, and you have to be willing to go away from that. And many don't want to. And I, and, you know, maybe this is my own bias, but I found that, you know, people that are really successful students in high school don't do that well. There are other people that don't do it well as also. But, um, you know, if you're a terrible student. So what you're student, saying is this is why my wife never read my dissertation. That's exactly why. <laughs> no, she didn't read your dissertation because she's just not interested. Uh, you know, like my John, wife. John, did you get straight A's? <laughs> I did, actually. <laughs> With few exceptions. What did you not get a straight A in? Uh, I got a B in calculus in high school, hmm. and I got a B plus in formal logic in undergrad, which perhaps should strip me of my rogue Aristotelian title. Yeah. Well, I was an engineering student, and I, uh, I did not get straight A's. Oh, I was not smart enough to get straight C's. That would have been, that would have been better. Okay, so let's do this socrates says all i am doing i'm doing nothing other than asking him questions and am not teaching him is that true this is a point that people fight on they think he's teaching he's drawing in the dirt and pointing at stuff i don't think he's teaching but he's not merely asking questions because somebody who doesn't know this proof could ask all kinds of questions and the two of them would never get there. Yeah. Uh, well, my answer to that is there, is there at any point where he tells him the answer? And even if there were, Let's go back to Mino's paradox. There's, there's one point where he might tell him the answer. But if you go back to the paradox, the boy has to be able to recognize that it's true. This is not, you know, mere facts of history, which I guess you just memorize. This is a geometry problem. It's a particular reason why, well, there must be some reason why he picks geometry. Geometry, if you've done it right ever in your past, with the proofs, at some point you see it and you can't not see it. Like, oh, that's the answer. I built it off that line. There's an intuition. Uh, the world goes sparkly, light bulbs come on, uh, angels play, and you know how it's done. But how do you go from not knowing to knowing? What is knowing? What is the state? I know what it feels like. Yeah, it feels like you remembered it. Aha! Like you uh -huh. found your keys. Um, right. I, I think that Socrates like is that. teaching, but he's not teaching him how. He's not teaching him how to square that cube, or or or, or square the square. He's not teaching that. He's teaching him a method. I think he's teaching. You do? Uh, you think he's teaching no, him how to I don't. do the proof? I, I don't think he's teaching. Okay. I think he is pointing. Yeah. But if you've got somebody but that's the a... pointing presumes, well, the pointing presumes that you can see. And 
pointing at things in space because geometry is you know it's earth measuring that's what the word means uh it means you have some sort of spatial intuition uh, so let me tell you do i really think we pre-existed and well some days i do but probably not what i really think about recollection um is probably something more like what kant said or what the phenomenologists say you know that the mind is not a blank slate the mind has a structure uh it is ordered to the universe that's why i really like that quote where socrates says that all things are akin your mind is is has a kinship with geometry they're cousins you're you're already geometrical and it's because you're already geometrical that when I point to the right line to make the double square, you can recognize it and say, aha, if you were completely ungeometrical, I couldn't do it. So recollection, you do not come to the problem. Mino is wrong. You do not come to it completely blank. You come to it with, I, uh, you know, categories. This is the way Kant puts it. You come at it with basic intuitions and structures of consciousness uh, i'm sorry that's too modern but well the scholastics uh, so you recollect the forms that's the way he says well, well the scholastic tell, tell us that the mind is ordered um towards a um with with a sensitivity to um to 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 understand reality and that the mind is built yeah. that the mind is built so that reality can resonate within it and yeah, uh, it's a reality machine it's a reality machine and that this you know we we might call it intuition your intuition says aha this is correct but 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 you know your 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 passive intellect is actually you know doing comparisons with things that you are remembering for other experiences um and and then you know there's a lot of mystical stuff going on here that the the materialists just won't address but there's a somehow you know somehow from previous experiences there's somehow yeah we we can we can yeah. recognize the truthiness of the of the proof as you may know i used to and might still read a whole bunch of science fiction uh we need to talk about that. And when you have the, the casual science fiction, you know, the spaceship pulls into, the, the Enterprise pulls into the new um, solar system and they, they meet the aliens and they just start talking. And they completely elide the, any difficulty in figuring out how these people think, whether they think, you know, you would just flip on the Universal Translator, the MacGuffin, and off we are and then kirk can fall in love with the green lady from orion uh if there were such things if there were other intelligences would you be able to talk to them are, maybe are, are there multiple ways <laughs> but there's some things that have to be true are there multiple ways of being intelligent and and i don't mean like if there e isn't EQ, then you can do it iq whatever but you know, if intelligence is um, pattern recognition and the ability to synthesis and to, syn to synthesize new concepts from previously known concepts, I think there's only one way to be intelligent. There might be degrees more or less of that, yeah. but they're all going to be the same but species. If, if you're right, then we can talk to them. You know, people say I'm a I'm a visual learner. Okay. I'm an oral learner, but I think I'm a smell learner. I learn from smells. Uh, I tell you what, there are things that can be learned from odor. From smells? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, one, that's a joke, uh, but also it, if you believe that the senses correspond to reality and they give you real data about what's happening around you, yeah, you can learn from that. And if I gouged your eyes yeah. out and so when we've poked your eardrums out, um, you know, you would be more, you would learn more from that. 
I'm not going to put that into practice. So what they'll do on these little spaceships that we've sent out, they'll put like prime numbers on a gold plate and hope that if somebody finds it, that they too experience prime numbers. Because if they don't, you can't you can't build any kind of a bridge of conversation. You, you don't want to talk you know, to them. Do they way. even? Yeah, if they don't have prime numbers, they're not worth talking to. Go to some other galaxy. Uh, so if there is a kinship between the mind and the universe, the world, all the things that are, well, whether you call it recollection or Kantian categories or Aquinas talks about con naturality in reference to the mind, the mind is kind of like the things that it knows. It becomes the thing that it knows. The intellect In does. a way, yeah. in a sense. Yeah. Uh, that's what's going on. There's some kind of kinship between mind and things. Uh, I like the recollection story. It's poetic, but something's going on. I'll uh, take it out of, out of the realm of science fiction, which I am not as familiar with. Uh, that <laughs> building... Many the... days. Uh, that building a bridge with somebody, this is something that Socrates did earlier with Mino, right? When he's trying to help him say, you know, do you know what the limits of things are? Can you work those things out? He's taking the things that he knows and working with them. And, and I'm actually, as you were saying all of this, Carl and Scott, I, I thought, is this actually what Socrates is doing with the myth about recollection and the soul's immortality? So if you look at uh, starting at right above 85E, Socrates says, right, if he had it always, the slave boy, he was always a knower. But if he got hold of it at a certain point, he would not have done so in this life, at least, or as someone taught him geometry. For with respect to geometry as a whole and all the other subjects of learning, he will do these same things. Is there anyone, then, who has taught him all things? It's just for you to know, I suppose, especially since he was born and raised in your household. This is what you alluded to earlier, Carl. And Mino says, for my part, I do not know. I do know that no one has ever taught him. Uh, and if you skip down a little bit to 86b, you see Socrates say, uh, in mine uh, to Mino, as for the other points, at least, I wouldn't insist very much on behalf of the argument. But by that, but that by supposing one ought to inquire into things he doesn't know, we would be better and more manly and less lazy than if he sh we should always suppose either that it's impossible to discover those things that we don't know or that we ought not to inquire in them. About this, I certainly would do battle if I could, both in speech and in deed. And I'm wondering if the soul's immortality argument, because this is where the dialogue starts to shift into distinguishing true opinion from knowledge or episteme. You could translate that as science. Socrates knows that Mino doesn't really understand what knowledge or science is. But he does know that Mino has some sense about what is immortal and what is divine. And that's his anchor point, right? Mino's like the alien in that regard that he's finding the common basis to help move him towards a truer understanding of what scientific knowledge is. But he has to start with the thing that he knows, which might be a little mystical. Mm -hmm. So do you think, uh, do you think that Socrates believes in the forms or are they rhetorically useful? Or somewhere in the middle? You're going to put me on the spot probably somewhere in the middle. I think people yeah. I think people get too hung up on the forms. Yeah, me too. Um right what he's trying to convey is he's trying to give you an intellectual image. Uh right, and he's using what is sensible to you. Like we have seen forms of things and he's trying to show you that your intellect is capable of sight in some way. But I I think people do get a little too wrapped up into trying to work out the particulars of that that if they just step back it's like if i say tree what happens is if it, you picture so, a tree in your mind then you're doing something with yeah. a form yeah i get uh, uh i get quite annoyed with that so there's i think it's gregory vlastos who sketches out the you know early middle and late dialogues of plato and the way he does it is 
he theorizes that uh, the doctrine of forms is not Socratic, but is Platonic. And so the more formy the dialogues are, the more they go in the middle period. And then there's some kind of reconsideration at the end in the laws, and they're not so important again. So he works out his whole timeline based on the forms being super important. And I, I don't, in my reading of them, I don't find them early, late, and middle. I find them just all about the same. You know, it's it's the same voice talking to me in all of these. Uh, so he he's assumed what he wants to prove, you know, that there was a development in doctrine, and then he uses it to argue. And maybe the doctrine was never a big deal. Yeah, Plato is certainly not as Platonic as, as Plotinus, Plotinus makes him out to be is the neo the neoplatonists are way more platonic than than he uh, was um but but uh, yeah i think it's in between like john said you know there is a problem of in, addressing how do we recognize universals and to say that there's a form and we apprehend that form is a way to discuss that and move on like are, are we going to talk about forms and how we find universals? Or are we going to try to define, define virtue? We need to talk about virtue right now. So, you know, for him to say, well, there's a form of this. What is that form? You know, how do things partake in it? Let's us actually to talk about the thing in hand and leave that, and leave that epistemological problem aside. Yeah. Is the form of beauty beautiful? You know, people worry about that a lot. It's like my kids like to argue about whether water is wet they are of the opinion that it is not because wet means to be covered with water, I guess, or to have a surface covered with water, but water is just water. So water is not actually wet. Uh, I don't know. I, what I, I read about that. I, I disavow. Quite... <laughs> well, you have to take it up with uh, child number three. Uh, and then you can figure out whether a hot dog is a sandwich or a taco. It's a big problem. Speaking of definition, it it, it is a big problem, and, and we're I not. I think we should figure that out instead of figure out this dialogue. <laughs> if we figured it out, we I think a taco is a hot dog. Tricky. Uh, so anyway, so we're in the middle. We don't know what the answer is. I think um, the. Uh, the choice of geometry problem is uh, particularly good because the answer is an irrational number. And not double a square on any line that you can straightforwardly draw on that square. Uh, it's got to be the diagonal, as you're going to find out, which is the square root of two if you're doing it decimally, and the square root of two has infinity digits in base 10 represent well in any base representation um you can't represent it as a fraction so S socrates is playing a dirty trick slave boy i'm going to ask you to find a number that you can't possibly find at least well you can but you're going to have to think sideways on it and uh i um i wonder if that was on purpose of course. Of course it's on purpose. Of course. But I wonder what the purpose of it is. Well, I mean, he's well, just if you're waiting out there wondering how the problem is solved, should we tell him how the problem is solved? Sure. He draws a big square. Yeah. Um, draws a big square uh, of, of four by four squares. So four squares put together. And then he draws a diagonal. The, the boy, this is, if he teaches, this is where he teaches, because Socrates draws a diagonal across each square, and all of these squares that have area of four, well, the part, you know, across the diagonal is two, and if you add up four twos, you get eight, and so then he points to this kind of turned square in the middle of the diagram, gives him a, a word. Uh, but he, he doesn't draw and, the line. Like at eighty five A, he he asks him, you know, if I if I cut e so he makes a big square out of four of the little squares, the two by two squares. And he asks him, 
you know, if, if I cut each of those small ones in half, that'll give us half of the eight, right? I mean, he doesn't, mm -hmm. he doesn't actually draw them. He does, he continues to ask the darn questions is, is my point. Yeah, and so he says, this is 85B. Uh, so this square, if we if we draw these lines, becomes how many feet? Eight square feet from what sort of line? And the, the slave says, from this one, and presumably points. The one that cuts from corner to corner, the four square foot figure? Yes. So you can see, there it is on the camera. And then, also interesting to me, See, I'm digging up esoteric meanings and things because. Oh, stop. stop. Uh, why? Why did you pick this, Plato? In 85b, just before 85c, and the sophists call this the diameter. Other translations call it bag, was probably diameter in Greek. So, if the name of this is diameter, diameter, it would be from the diameter, as you assert, Mino slave, that the doubled figure would come to be. So he does give him a term, and he mentions it's from the sophist. Interesting. In my translation, he says, clever men, not sophist, clever men call this... The... Sophistoi. Yeah. He's, you say, why did he pick this? I don't think there's anything tricky here. He's just the consummate teacher. He's just, he's just the best there ever was. And, and he's able to put people yeah. in positions to wring the most out of the problem at hand. That's why we're still reading him. And, well, and it's a geometry problem that's going to lead you to perplexity. If you guess three, it's no good. There's no way you're going to guess that number because no. you can't. It's, it's a, an irrational number. You can only point to it. Now, very cool, Socrates. If this kid, if this slave boy, gets um, does the proof, and he draws that out, and he points at those four diagonals and says, "Well, the the double of that square is a square with the with sides the length of these uh, diagonals." Does he have knowledge, or did he just figure out, learn the parlor trick, and have true opinion? That's the next question. Well, what makes the what's the difference between knowledge and opinion? Um, true opinion could be loosey goosey. Um, you you believe? Um, <laughs> I almost talked about the germ theory of disease, um, but I won't <laughs> do that. Um, you you you, you, you have probably the, believe in calculus. You have the right answer, but you don't know why, or the re, or you or you uh, got the wrong the right answer yeah. through an incorrect method. You know this is the thing that the teacher wants to avoid when they tell you to show the, your work. You know, did you? Yeah, did you I, I told you about my friend in college. My my friend in college, um, my friend Scott, different Scott who uh, would never study for the tests. This is in engineering classes. He never studied. And he annoyed me because he got A's. And uh, well, I said, well, how are you doing this? How are you? Because we had, I, I would have like sheets of formulas to remember. And I'd be drilling up until the moment of the test and so worried. And the you know, first thing that, that, that you open the test book, I start writing every formula that I remember. So it can get out of my brain and then I can just think about the test. Terrible idea. Should have done what he did because I could have. What he did is he would just derive whatever it was that he needed. Mm -hmm. He knew the basic principles and he could figure out everything else because he knew I did not know. I had opinions about the relations between forces and, and shear and, and all of that stuff. I, I had opinions. I did not have knowledge. He had knowledge. Uh, I think in this case, that boy can probably reconstruct that proof if he goes back home and Mino's mom says, how do you double a square? Uh, then uh, 
I think the kid could probably come up with it. Well, how is that true? Why isn't it three? Well, let me show you, mom. And, uh, or Mino's mom. Let me show you Mino's mom. I think he could probably give the account, give the logos for it. Because he knows it. You'll never convince him otherwise. An opinion, you could be convinced otherwise. If you have knowledge, you can't be convinced otherwise. This is why I tell people they need to work their way through Euclid's <laughs> Elements, book one. It's back there behind I me. I love watching John think. Where is I'm it? I'm just wondering what he's going to say uh, It's back behind me. Um, book one of Euclid's Elements, I think there's 26 proofs. I don't remember. But you start with the definition of a point, and you work your way up with various proofs and constructions until you prove for yourself the Pythagorean theorem. And it's pre-algebra. So they didn't have symbolic representation. The A squared plus B squared equals C squared thing didn't exist yet. Um, but you can prove it for yourself. And this is when you, you actually have true knowledge of the thing. Because when, when they, in pre-algebra or whatever, seventh, eighth grade, whatever, they tell you A squared plus B squared equals C squared, it's just a magic incantation. You might as well say abracadabra mm -hmm. to find the length of the hypotenuse. But if you actually go through book one of the elements, the Pythagorean, Pythagorean theorem is yours forever. And you understand it and you could, you could forget and you could get back to it. But if you somehow forgot a squared plus B squared equals C squared, you would never, you know, you hit your head with a coconut on Gilligan's Island. Like you would never get back to it. Yeah. That's correct so I opinion. Think he's got knowledge. Well, I think it's more than correct opinion because he's got, he can give the account. Well, if you have the ace, if you, if you know the algebraic Pythagorean theorem, I think that's correct opinion. Right. Okay. So that's correct opinion. You're going to calculate the length of the, of the third line just as well. Yep. As the guy who's done the proof. So as far as actions in the world, correct opinion is as good as knowledge. And we're going to come to this, um, at some point tonight, probably <laughs> when they can't figure out whether virtue can be taught or not, they, they decide, well, maybe it's just true opinion. That is what we're stuck with. Uh, we'll have to see if opinion is as good as knowledge. And by name, it's not. I just said to do a little Greek wordplay, right? The word for opinion is doxa from the verb dokeo to seem. Mm -hmm. So opinion is always a seeming. And then when they're searching for knowledge, that's episteme, which by its roots means to stand upon something. Episteme is to stand epi upon. Yeah. So if something seems, it's not standing on anything. But knowledge would stand upon something. And that would be how you re replicate it. But the question, yeah. to get to what you were saying, in the practical matters of virtue, does virtue stand upon anything? Or is virtue just a true seeming with no foundation? Oh, gosh. Isn't that a, a loaded question? Right? Um, much, much debated. Is there such a thing as a nature? You know, is there the good? And if there is, then you can base virtue on that which leads towards the good. But this is Mino never doubts the good. No, it's true. That's true. Um, but does virtue stand upon the good? Or is it just that which seems good? If it if it just seems good, then it's like the statues of Daedalus. Did you get that image? Yeah. So this is later in the dialogue. We're skipping a few things. Um, it's in Euthyphro. I don't even know. Yeah, I don't know where it is in, in the dialogue. Um, so I'll just do it from memory. The Why would you even care to have knowledge? Well, opinions are like the statues of Daedalus. Daedalus is the famous uh, primordial inventor of Athens. Uh, if you know the story of Icarus, the guy with the wings who flew too close to the sun and fell into the water. That's his kid. Well, the legend is if you bought statues that he made, so say you got 
garden gnomes by Daedalus that you would need to chain them down because they are so lifelike that they will uh, they just fly they'll away. just start walking. Yeah. So you need to chain them down. And the chain is the account that you give, the logos that you figure out, the, the why it's true. Yeah. So if you just know that something's true, but you don't know why, you could be convinced otherwise. Okay. So is that what the analogy is? You know, if it's not chained down, then you can be, it's not, your knowledge isn't secure and it could be, you could be convinced otherwise. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's the, the sure. So you learned something about virtue. Uh, let, let's say uh, temperance is a virtue. Okay, so moderation in food and drink and sex. Okay, so you learn temperance is a virtue, and you even learn some practical um, limits to temperance. You know, for yourself. But then you're at a party, and she walks up and offers you a drink. And what happens to your temperance if you don't have an account of it? You don't know it if you just kind of think it because somebody told you, like your dad told you. But now you're in this situation. Your temperance might just get up and walk away. Many such cases, probably. Many such I think that the chain in this analogy is the thing that ties your knowledge to other knowledges you have. Because mm -hmm. if you have a, if you memorize a squared plus B squared equals C squared for the exam, that's a floating abstraction for you. It's hard to put, it's hard to connect that with other things that you know. So you can have correct opinion and probably you, you would have a great difficulty like connecting that idea with another idea you had and then come up with a new original correct idea. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's unmoored. You, yeah, you, I you like that. So maybe you tie all of your, your things that you think you know together. You have a whole bunch of chains. That means it's going to be hard for any one of them to walk off. Because it's connected with everything else you, you think is true. Yeah, and and I think you're I think you're right too. You know, you, you, it moors you as an individual with the knowledge that you have, but I think it also, you know, we're also tying those ideas together, and uh, we can start to have a mind that is a unity, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, so we're still halfway through this thing. <laughs> we're more than halfway. Yep. Uh, kind of. So they get out. So Mino's been satisfied that knowledge is possible. So all you need to do to disprove skepticism as a universal is find one counterexample. If there's one kid somewhere who learns anything, then skepticism is garbage. Yes, and or yes, but like, what does what does learn mean? You know, uh, if if you memorize yes. the Pythagorean theorem through rote, did that person learn it? I um, do not think so. I don't think so either. I hold a um, an education training distinction in my mind. It's like the friend enemy one. Like, no. You could, you know, if you if you actually are educated, then um, it's more about method, and you're able to then take your education and obtain more knowledge by yourself. Of course, we have to have inputs, uh, maybe books, experience, sense data, okay. whatever. But you can do that yourself. The person that is trained um, can only iterate at that point. Like if they're trained to do dovetail joinery. Maybe they can get better at that, but they may not be able to do anything but that because the training is typically specific and uh, it's done by rote. It's not conceptual. 
and most education that we have now. You know, we talked earlier, I don't know if it was before we turned the live on here or not, but you were talking about education. You know, they got this, this emphasis on critical thinking. You cannot teach mm-hmm. critical thinking when, when the mode of teaching is that of training. You can only teach to correct opinion at that point. John furrowed his brow. Explain yourself. Uh, not. I'll do my best. Give an account. Uh, I'm thinking about where Socrates takes Mino after they agree that they can still search for something. And I was trying to think about the relevance of the section. I'm looking at 86D, say 87C. It's this question about learning from hypotheses, which right, uh, we hear hypothesis in a very specific context today. Uh, but again, there's wisdom in the Greek terms. A hypothesis is that which is above, upo, what is set down. Um, Tithemi is the verb for setting down. And so the, the proposal is that we could learn Right, if we set down things on top of, right, uh, of a foundation, and I'm wondering if if that's the way out of this dilemma, right? That let's try, let's just try setting things down, and see where they go. And we will find, if there's a foundation there that we have set down well upon, or if it's a foundation of sand. Uh, but I do take your point about the problem of teaching critical thinking, right? As it's, as it's taught, it's usually in a way to tear down, not to construct. And Socrates is not saying necessarily just construct for the sake of construct. It's let's construct to see if there's a foundation to construct on. Uh, it's actually probably more radical than Hmm. contemporary philosophies. And that might be the path but you have to trust something to do that. Yep. What do you have to trust? Well, that kid learned geometry, so we can maybe we can maybe think about virtue. Well, you in? You'll be less lazy and effeminate if you do it. <laughs> you'll be more manly, that's what he says. That's what he says. Yeah, what what do you have to trust though to do this dialectical which, inquiry, which is what you're talking about, I I'm guessing, is you know, what do you have to believe then? What do you have yeah. to trust to do that, John? I have opinions. Oh, this is where my mind has been turning because there is a point a little later where Socrates says something that even when I read it, I was a little shocked that he said it. Uh, So I was numbed by it. (sighs) I'm looking now at 89D. And Mino says, what then? With a view to what are you dissatisfied with it and distrust virtues being knowledge? And Socrates says, I'll tell you, Mino, as for its being something teachable, if in fact it is knowledge, this I don't retract as being ignobly stated. But examine whether, in your opinion, it is fitting that I distrust its being knowledge. So now Socrates is, right, earlier the argument was, I need to trust that I can find something to move forward. And now he is distrusting the argument that virtue is knowledge or episteme. Yeah. And I haven't figured out what to do with it. That's, this is why they killed him. <laughs> it's a curious thing. Well, if there is any matter, whatever is teachable, not only virtue, isn't it necessary for there to be both teachers and students of it? Um, which is, if it could be taught, it should be taught, right? Yeah. If it, if it were possible, it ought to be actual. Uh, and then we have what gets Anatus mad, which is some aspersions cast on the great men of Athens. Um, the, the darn dialogue ends in puzzlement. And uh, I, it's frustrating. You end it perplexed. Right, the same thing that happens to me now happens to you as you read it. Do you believe, John, that 
that Socrates is playing a, a, a trick here? Or do you think that this is a record of him changing his mind or, or, or having a doubt? I don't read it as him playing a trick. N n nor uh, and I actually think Carl might be putting it too strongly that you're left completely perplexed at the end of this dialogue. Because Socrates gives some pretty clear indicators of what virtue rests upon. Mino's not buying it. But I, I think in, in this moment where he says, I distrust that virtue is knowledge. I see some of what you're saying, that it's playful because he's saying, well, surely there would be teachers and students and I can't find the teachers. In fact, he, uh, the way he actually puts it at 89E, although I've, I've inquired many times whether there are any teachers of it, and although I make every effort, I am unable to discover any. Uh, he is without the capacity to discover any as he says. And so that could just be setting up Anatus and Mino for this pride. But I'm actually wondering uh, if virtue is in fact this thing that we talk about so confidently as if it is a knowledge. Right? There's a, an entire enterprise today in philosophy called virtue ethics that claims to know what virtue is. And they will hearken back to Plato and Aristotle when they do so, because, yes, Plato and Aristotle use the, ver the words of virtue. But Plato and Aristotle strike me as far more perplexed about what virtue is than virtue ethicists are. And so I think there's something here. I think Socrates may be saying something true. That virtue is not quite knowledge. That doesn't mean that there isn't a component to it through which you can know. But on this reading, I'm inclined to take him seriously, that he distrusts the argument. And if he distrusts the argument as a hypothesis, then he can't find what it stands upon. What about the alternative? I'm trying to find out where it is. What about the alternative that virtue is nature? Well, or divine. This would be 89A and following. That uh, I was trying to find the quotes from Theognis, and um, my eyes aren't working. If there would, so this is 89b, if the good were good by nature, and this would be uh, the more aristocratic ancient view. This is this is Theognis and Pindar. And uh, if you can find the Theognis quote uh, and tell me where it is, that would be great while I'm reading. Uh, if the good were good by nature, for if that were so, I suppose the following two would be the case. If those who are good did come to be by nature, there would be, I suppose, men who recognized for us those mm -hmm. among the young whose natures were good. These we would taste aside once they had pointed them out and guard them in the Acropolis, having them sealed up much more than we do gold so that no one might corrupt them, but rather once they come of age, they might become useful to the cities. And Socrates and Mino, I don't think they really address that. They, they just say, well, there aren't such people, so that people don't become good by nature. It's too quick. Uh, well, that's likely at least Socrates. And Socrates says, well, since... Since then, the good don't become good by nature, do they become such by learning? And I, I'm not so sure we've established that it isn't nature. Yeah, they... At least not by that argument. Uh, 95, got my, th got my uh, index to all of Plato. Theognis, uh, 95 D and E. That's where that quote is from, from Theognis. Yeah. 95 D, the, the question is whether it's teachable. And um, Theognis apparently says both things. So at 95 D, he says, uh, 
Socrates quotes him, be seated and be pleasing to them whose power is great. For from the noble, you will be taught noble things. But if with the bad you mingle, you will lose even the intellect you have. But then he says further, so apparently it is teachable. But then you go further and Theognis himself, who's next on my infinity list, says, uh, at 96a, by teaching, you will never make the bad men good. You only make the good better. And so Socrates says, well, they're contradicting themselves. But I think you could save Theognis. I think if Mina were on the ball, we could save Theognis. If, if you had not gotten rid of the notion that nature plays a part in virtue. Because those of a good nature could hang out with the virtuous and learn from them. But those with the non-virtuous nature, it wouldn't matter. You could not educate them into being virtuous. Well, of course, um, the whole thing is kicked off with this idea that, you know, we had these virtuous statesmen who had these kids that weren't, you know, that's really the problem that kicked right. the whole thing off. So, uh, yeah. by the way, you guys all need this. An index to play. I do not have it. A subject index using Stephanus pagination. Hmm. You need this. Just leave it in the bathroom. <clears throat> There's a pretty good index in the back of the complete hacket. Um, but I don't know. I like having the separate one um, for, well, you know, when I'm reading, I don't have to flip back and forth. Uh, this is very, very handy. And I have something, John, that you might have. Do you have the Princeton? Index to Aristotle. I have neither index. Well, so I, I guess am a charlatan. I'm, I guess I'm better than you. Um, you are. You're more organized. I don't know. These are uh, my books are not going to be in the Dewey Decimal System. They're going to be in the Carl's Memory System. <laughs> Where did I leave it's that? It's not book? good enough for me, man. So these are the, well, the, it's, the it's spatial. I have to walk in my mind into the room and reach for the book, and then I remember where it is. In my memory palace. So, so our what, alternative is at the beginning. It, can virtue be taught, or does it arise from nature, or some other way? You know, is it knowledge? Is it nature, or something else? I don't know that nature has been disposed of. Yeah, but back at ninety um, nine, um, I think it's ninety nine. The last page, um, Socrates says that you know it may be divine. Nature, I don't know. I mean, are these synonyms? But he, 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 he wonders if it is. We we should be right to call divine also the soothsayers and prophets who we, who we mention. Um, you know, he he says women call good men divine. Um, yeah, is it divine? Yeah, it is. I think. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we should go through the examples of, so Anatus shows up, and Anatus, if you do not know, dear listener, is one of the people that brings the charge against Socrates that gets him killed. Uh, and they ask him some questions. Anatus is a virtuous man by anybody's measure. His dad made his own money. He brought up Anatus. Uh, uh, he must be virtuous because the people of Athens keep electing him. Right? They must see his virtue, and because democracy is the best form of government, as I was taught in high school, uh, Anathus must be virtuous by virtue of winning the elections. And they start, you know, if, if you wanted to learn, the Socrates does this all the time. If you wanted to learn any one of these crafts, you could hire somebody. You could be a shoemaker, you could find somebody to teach you, a physician, an owlless player. An owlless is like an ancient oboe. I think it's a double Alice, but uh, well, who would you go to to become virtuous? And uh, well, I, don't you know? Socrates says, well, wouldn't it be the sophists? After all, people do go to them to learn virtue. You'll see that in Protagoras. What's his name? Hippias goes to Protagoras to try to become wise. You know, what do you do to become virtuous? Well, you go to college. You know, you go where those people are. You pay the money and you, you go. 
And Anatus's reaction uh, is kind of like John's reaction. Uh, Hush, Socrates, may no madness of this kind seize anyone among my family or relatives or friends, for they, the sophists, are plainly the ruin and corruption of those who associate with them. So well, didn't you say something earlier about how they ruin everything? Yeah. Sharing Anatus's opinion. They do. Uh, that's uh, shortly thereafter that passage at uh, 91D, where Socrates says, um, you know, I'll back up. Yeah, 91D. He says, I can't see uh, my way of trusting you. I'm going to change believing to trust just so we can see that idea occur again. I can't see my way of trusting you, for I know one man, Protagoras, who acquired more money from his wisdom than both Aphidius, who produced such notably beautiful works, and ten other sculptors taken together. And indeed, what you say is amazing. Those who work on old shoes and men cloaks wouldn't be able to escape notice for 30 days if they were to give the cloaks and shoes back in a worse condition than when they received them, but would soon mm -hmm. perish by stoning if they were to do things of that sort. Whereas Protagoras, who corrupted those who associated with him and sent them back in a worse condition than when he received them for more than 40 years escape the notice of the whole of Greece. For I think he died at the age of nearly 70, being 40 years in the practice of the art. And in all this time, still to this very day, he hasn't ceased being well thought of. And not only Protagoras, but very many others besides, both those who came before him and those who are still alive even now. Uh, this is a common trope in Socrates, uh, but it's, it's a great trope, right? It's like, so to stick with the things you were saying about nature, one of the things he likes to point out is like, uh, I'm going to flash back to the Republic for a second. Socrates says, if you put a plant in bad soil, what's going to happen? It's going to die. But if you put it in good soil, it'll grow. Right? Everybody immediately understands that truth about nature. But then when you talk about who should educate the young, it's, well, everybody can educate them. Right. In fact, that seems to be the argument that Anasis is making. Let the multitude can educate. But mm -hmm. we always fail to make this connection. And the same thing with the arts. What's the purpose of an art? Is it to develop a skill or to produce something? Or is it to make money? And here, Protagoras has all this reputation. He's a moneymaker, but he ruins people. And nobody can seem to put two and two together. Right? They understand what it takes to raise natural things, but for some reason, when you ask them about human beings, everybody gets stupid. Am, am I the only okay, one? Okay, so that, this notion that anybody... Am I the only one that wrote universities in the margin next to that? I mean, it's a little too close to home. Scott. For 40 years. I mean, he actually says 40 years, and I go... Yeah. Maybe 50, but... Um, yeah. Well, when they... Well, if universities produced virtue, boy, that would be wonderful. They should raise the tuition if that was the case. Uh, uh, I think if we, uh, when we get to the Protagoras someday, um, Protagoras says the same thing that everybody in Athens has a share, everybody in Greece has a share of the ruling virtue given by Zeus. And um, that's an opinion, that's actually a political opinion. If you're going to say, as I was taught in high school, that democracy is the best of all political systems, you have to believe that everybody is capable of justice. If it were restricted by nature or education or something else, you could not in good conscience say that democracy makes any sense. So you're kind of arguing backwards. If you live in a democracy and wish to promote it as being the good, you have to say, well, everybody can teach virtue. Virtue's not hard. Not only Just can everybody teach the, it, the polls. everyone can learn it, too. Mm -hmm. Man is perfectible. Yeah, so they're motivated to this conclusion by the political system that they're in. Um, yeah, do you find it, John, funny that it is the clown Anitus who has never met a sophist who utters the opinion that you hold to? It is funny. The clown. <laughs> Meant to push my buttons. 
is Socrates a sophist? That is the obvious conclusion. It is a, a conclusion, yeah. Uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, this Plato is tricky. Why, why does he do things like this? Why is Anathus the one that is saying the thing that seems the most reasonable, that sophists are a curse? Socrates says, perhaps you're a prophet, Anathus. For I should wonder how else you know about them on the basis of what you yourself say. Uh, maybe he is a prophet. You know, virtue is, in the end of the dialogue, something divine. Maybe Anathus divinely knows that the sophists are creepy. Isn't this stuff fun? I, I can't talk to the listeners today, but I'm, I'm talking to you. Isn't this stuff fun? You know, like the point, what's the point of it? Coming out with knowledge of what virtue is? <clears throat> um, perplexity might be the point, um, but also just delight. If you can make that shift and not let the numbness get you down. This is fun. We, we've been going for an hour 40, and you, you said this is a, del a delight. Um, and it is. Um, we we did cover some material on the last page. You know the fact that the fact uh, that virtue has a divine origin. Um, the fact. Can I interject something really quick. <laughs> yeah, I do. Uh, I, so I I do because I've I remember seeing this gripe in the some of the OGB forums about that at the end virtue is just divine, and I just want to point out that Socrates actually alludes to something different in the midst of that argument that is an important clue if you know how to pay careful attention to him so i'm looking at 99e going into 100a socrates says for now if we inquired and were speaking nobly in this account as a whole virtue would be neither by nature nor something teachable but present in those in whom it is present by divine allotment without intellect unless someone should be that sort of political man able to make another skilled in politics as well. And if you just follow that statement about intellect back all the way to 88B, Socrates says to Mino, examine whether in your opinion, some of these that are not knowledge, but are other than knowledge at one time do harm, but another are advantageous. For example, courage, if courage is not prudence, but a certain sort of boldness, isn't it the case that when a human being is bold without intellect, it is to his harm, but when with intellect, it is to his advantage? That's a clue. There is something about the intellect that neither Anatus nor Mino is willing to account for, but to say that Socrates tells you it's just all divine and not catch that he's been trying to sow that seed and they're not taking it. That's a clue. And that's what makes reading a dialogue like this fun. If you know what Socrates values, in fact, if you know a little bit what Aristotle values, because at the end of the ethics, he says the intellect is the most divine thing within us. You might see that there's a different sort of argument sewn into this conversation but you gotta dig you have to search and you have oh, to right. learn why but but okay but why why doesn't he just tell me <laughs> well uh earlier right socrates points out to mino uh you're trying to rule me why don't you just ease back a little bit i remember doing this in my class i looked at my students and i said is our relationship one of ruler and ruled and they said no which is right. Uh, but in order for you to learn, I have to get you to see it yourself. Right. Right. You can't tell people. They won't recollect it. If they, Whatever it is that is the faculty of intellect, perhaps, uh, that allows you to see the truth of the matter. I can't make you see the truth of the matter doesn't matter how much talking I do, I can't make you see the truth. I can point to things, but I can't I can't prove them. You you're the only one that proves them to you. And so a dialogue form, you know, this is why uh, philosophy is quite often esoteric. 
it's why the books are hard. They're all beginner books and they're all hard because you're not really doing it if you get the bullet points. You need to think through it yourself and get what you can out of it and uh, be perplexed. And it's okay. Be comfortable in your perplexity. If somebody tells you the answer, you can only recollect their telling and you end up with correct, with the correct um, opinion. You, you have yeah, to, you have not to, nothing. It's not no. nothing. You can, it's not. you can find the length of the hypotenuse, you know, but, but you have to come on to it yourself. Learn, learning is done inside the student. The yeah. teacher can't coercively, they can't make you learn. They can't do it. It has to be done in the student. I, I tell people the orientations of online great books that, you know, pe uh, people, people can't be taught. They only learn. And this, I believe. We've got about 15 minutes before this will be two hours long. And I would like to discuss, like, so what, what are the big beats here? Why does this thing matter? You know, we, we've, there, there are kind of five big points the way I see it in this book, you know, the, you know, what is virtue? Uh, can virtue be taught? What is knowledge? Uh, the correct opinion, um, um, and then uh, you know the the nature or, or like the origin of virtue. Um, so what? what? What is this? What does this mean uh, okay. in the world? Well, all right. So we have the examples. I think um, where Atticus gets really mad is the examples that are given of famous people: Themistocles, Aristides, Pericles, Thucydides. And uh, was there another one? Anyway, these are famous men of Athens, men expert in the political things, as Socrates says. And none of them had virtuous children, at least not politically virtuous. And so this is used to show that virtue cannot be taught because wouldn't Themistocles, he taught his kids to ride horses, wouldn't he have taught them virtue if it could be taught? Yeah, it was free to do so even, and it still didn't happen. Uh-huh. And, um, you know, all the rest of them, uh, it's a different Thucydides, it's not the historian. Uh, when he's talking about Pericles at 94b, perhaps it's not something teachable. If all of these people, but there's a couple of conclusions you could get from this. You could conclude that because these virtuous men did not teach their children, that it is not something teachable. You could also conclude that uh, they didn't want to. Anathus says that somewhere. He says, well, if he wanted to, he could have taught it. So perhaps they're not teaching political virtue because, well, political virtue has to do with ruling and maybe you don't want to teach it to anybody. That's a little side note. Mm -hmm. uh, it could be that Pericles, Themistocles, etc., are not actually good at political things, that they're not actually virtuous. Which I, I think is the meaning that Anatus takes when he gets really, really mad and says, uh, you know, you should not speak so easily ill to people because it's easy to do harm to you in Athens. It's a threat which he carries out. Yep. Um, there's other conclusion you could draw. So I'm I'm sitting here thinking, well, what about nature? Because um, I, I don't think this dialogue gets rid of nature. I think it, it doesn't talk about it kind of on purpose. And so I'm wondering if that's part of what, where we're meant to think. Uh, but even if it's nature, well, then their kids should have been virtuous by nature. If Themistocles has the virtuous nature, it should be breed true, right? If you breed a dog, it's going to be somewhat like uh, it's um, sire and bitch, right? That the, the the puppy is going to be somewhat like the parents. Um, yeah. So what so of it? Maybe it's well, maybe it's not teachable. Okay. So this, what of it? Yeah. So there you are that, in that's, Athens. That's Adler's uh, last question. When did this dialogue get published? You know, when this dialogue gets published, what has Athens been through? Where have these men led it? 
yeah, they've uh, uh, they've been stomped by the Spartans, and they are they in the middle of the Thirty Tyrants, or are we through with that? Um, uh, what well, depends on the actual publication date? Yeah, uh, but uh, probably after the Thirty Tyrants. Yeah, but the the, the glory that was Athens is done. Th- th- this is actually a society. Yeah, so decline. if they were good at political things, then we wouldn't. We reading this when Plato published it wouldn't be in the fix we're in now, subject to the Macedonians or the Spartans or the Persians. Were they really good? You know, is your nation, is your city actually virtuous? Um, and can and if it isn't, can it be made virtuous? You know, th- you know, what's swinging on it now? You know, I, to to me, th- all of these questions are the some of the most important questions. You know, when you send somebody to public school or any darn school, what are you actually doing? What is actually possible? If virtue can't be taught, if virtue can't be taught and man isn't perfectible, then what is the school doing? What do you hope it's doing? If virtue can't be taught, what do you what are you doing with incarceration? Are you putting people in cages so they don't harm others? Or are you trying to improve them and reform them so that they'll do no wrong again? Like um, true knowledge, correct opinion. You know, what is the standard that we should hold when we are uh, educating or training people? Uh, child rearing. How do you raise the kid? Sure. What do you expect of the child? These questions are enormous sociological well, problems. Well, and if it's, if it's even nature a little bit, then you have questions of, well, how are we going to do marriage and family? Uh, nobody wants to think about that. I have a dear friend that says everyone's a eugenicist when they're dating. <laughs> Who was that? It was you, Dr. Shoot. Oh. Um, yeah, but but these questions, I'm not, I'm not prepared to say that they're answered here, but these questions are important for public policy, education, child rearing, jurisprudence, on and on and on. Uh, interpersonal relationships, you know, do you, do you correct, how do you, how do you, you know, quote unquote, correct someone who is an error, who is close to you? Um, what good is that doing? What kind of expectations do you have of your fellow man? The, the, these questions, the, 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 the getting it right makes everything better and we still can't get it mm-hmm. right. If we could, your schools would work. Your crime rate would go down. Um, our, our laws would be better. Uh, mm. Our buildings would be more plumb. Like everything would be better. <laughs> Is it true that none of the schools work? I think that's right. I think that if they work, it's but accidental. Yeah, what about, I mean, what about that, that John Sr. thing that uh, we've been talking about? You know, um, the the learning the if learning is internal to the student then the students did all the work um and 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 and, and Dr. Senior Quinn and Nellick you know were they were there pointing at things but those that saw well, and learned saw and learned you know they well, could let's they, do Let's let's do another hypothesis. So on the last page, Socrates says that perhaps it is something divine, like poets and soothsayers or whatever. Let's pr- suppose that's true. That it is somehow a gift of the gods. Uh, how would your education policy change if this is true? You have a bunch of kids, and I suppose we got to teach them something. Uh, some of them are going to have the divine gift. Mm-hmm. Could you could you snuff out that light if you do it wrong? I think you can. You might not be able to give them the light. But I think you could like for me that theognis quote, I think that's in there on purpose. The the um if you have the right kind of nature and he, he listens to the right kind of people, that nature develops. But if somebody doesn't have it, you're not going to teach them into it. Um, 
Yeah, I'm sorry. I think this nature question is is not is unsettled in this dialogue. Uh, frustrating. The Greeks to me. always come back to it. Yeah. It's right. It's an idea that's at the bedrock of what they're trying to figure out. Um, is it not in at some the, ways? I think Scott, you were thinking. Is it not? At the, is it not at the bedrock of what we're trying to figure out? It's a question, right? It is either you will be unprovided about nature or you won't be. Um, I think that is that is the best that Socrates can do for you. Will you be open to trying to see whether or not nature is a force, a power, or a capacity? If it is, to what extent is it? If it's not, then why do we talk about it? Uh, but I, I think the, I mean, it's a big picture question, but you always meet it at a very personal level, which is the heart of this dialogue, right? Uh, Mino begins by saying he is not unprovided or perplexed about virtue at all. And by the end, Socrates tells Mino, if you could perhaps persuade Anatus, like, I have persuaded you. He might be gentler. And that could be better for everyone. Well, that's a conditional statement. I, I think even the broad-reaching political effects of Socratic philosophy, it's not so clear that Socrates actually thinks he's going to have a huge impact or that it should have a huge impact. But can you reach the people in front of you? That seems to be the move. That's the invitation. Yeah, it didn't work with Anatus. No. Probably didn't work with Mino, if we're going to believe Xenophon. Gosh, this dialogue's so good. I'm, I'm always like stirred up like a hive of bees after I read it. <laughs> I don't. Oh, darn it, Socrates! It, it's a. Uh, I I've read a, it. I've read it three times this year. Every time I read it, anything, I I date it and initial it at, on the end. In papers or whatever, I read this on the seventeenth of July. I finished it again on August fifth, and um, I've, I've read it and finished it again today. And. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've probably read it 14 or 15 times total. And, um, it's one of the most important to me. Um, there are, there are, there are dialogues that are, that are maybe more important. Um, but, but the basic question here of, of how ver can, can virtue be taught? What is knowledge? How do we teach all this, all this in here, all of the rest of the dialogues swing on this you know if he's talking to gorgias about uh, uh, uh or euthyphro that's the one i was thinking of. if you think talking about euthyphro about justice if virtue can't be taught his talk with euthyphro is worthless all of his other dialogues are junk not junk but but well, his, and if but virtue his, is not nature what's his, going on in the republic his project is his project is compromised you know, all of the, all of the dialogues swing on this. And this is why the, it's the first one that I wanted people to read at online great books. And yeah. I, I just keep yeah. coming back to it over and over and over again. It's also, even though we've belab belabored it for four hours, over four hours, uh, it's, it's, it's very approachable, I think. Uh, more approachable than Timaeus or yeah. uh, Parmenides. Yeah, sure. don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to read it slowly. Th these sorts of things, you know, if you can plow through a Harry Potter book in a night, uh, great, but don't do that to this. You know, Larry Correa, uh, Monster Hunters, go ahead, plow right through it. It's fun. You cannot do this. Chew on this book. Nietzsche says somewhere that he wants people to read slower. There's no virtue in reading quickly. I think it's genealogy of morals. He says you have to be like a cow. <laughs> you have to chew on it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he knows his Plato and Aristotle, that guy. 
Um, yeah. So the the these. I don't know. We're gonna, we'll, we'll call them the senior sessions. I don't know. Um, I, I hope people. I hope people watch these, listen to these, whatever, and you know, don't believe anything we say. But maybe, maybe try to do it like this. You know, ask each other questions, argue a little bit, ask a lot of questions of the text, um, and and and, sh- and struggle in a like way. I hope. Um, it's not, the, you know, what we just did isn't the only way to do it. It's maybe not even the best way to do it, but we found, or I have found that a lot of people don't know how to have a book discussion and they end up doing a book club, you know, it had a good beat. It was easy to dance to. I liked it. I didn't like it. Um, comment on style and then drink wine and, uh, nothing wrong with the wine drinking and there's nothing wrong with the book club either, but this merits more and we'll do more to you and for you. If you can engage it at a, at a deeper level, if you can ask yourself the questions that are being asked in the book and then ask the book, the questions. So I, I hope, I hope that people get some of that. Yep. Uh, well, should we wrap it up? What are we going to do next? Oh, we can leave that for offline. I, I, uh, well, we can talk about it a little bit. If we don't get a consensus, we can punt. Are, can can you do some chunks of the Iliad, John Pascarella? That's at a slow enough pace, yeah. Like a book at a time? Heck yeah, tw- it's a 26 shows. Let's go. <laughs> Every single line of the catalog of ships. I'm, I'm, I haven't read the Iliad fully since... Uh... It's undergrad, so yeah, it's, it's pretty it. good. Uh, per- perhaps the Iliad, perhaps the Iliad. Uh, I think I need, yeah, I think I need to. Uh, I think I need to give a tour of my reference library and uh, see see what see what else we can do that might be a help help to people because I you know like these indexes I have and, a, and I got my Liddell and Scott back here and. There's some of these things that can be a big help to people who are uh, to dig, digging into these things. If you just if you just just dive in with a um, a free PDF that you got off archive.org, uh, you might not be giving yourself every chance possible. And uh, we can we can start talking about maybe a little bit about how we read it, some of the things that we bring to it when we read it, and uh, and then argue it out. So that'll be uh, 26 books. I think it's 26 books, right? So that'll be 52 plus hours. That'll be awesome. Yeah, we might. I promise I won't begin with rage. (laughs) We will end with it. (laughs) Thank you guys so much.